You know, so far I've been lucky. I did some 25 items on Ford, and so far I haven't been roasted by the Ford community. That is, until recently. When I dare to venture in the dangerous realm of local variables. If you haven't seen that episode yet, it's listed in the description. You see, I stated that to implement local variables you only needed two lines. I was wrong. You need only one single line. Now, if you take a look at the definition, you'll see one non-standard word, semicolon, column. The origin of that word can be found in color word. It's roughly equivalent to execute as long as a return address constitutes a valid execution token. In that case, it calls the retrieve return address while leaving its own origin as a return address on the return stack. The effect in this case is that the callee executes the remainder of the caller while returning for the second part of the callee once the caller word is finished. If you don't understand, no problem, we'll get back to that in more detail later on. Now, why is it so brilliant? Because it uses a technique called coroutines. And all you need to implement coroutines in Ford are three lines. Compare that to C. It's so hard to do on C that it actually got its own name, a DUS device but it isn't standard and consequently isn't guaranteed to work on all C compilers. On the other hand, we're messing with the return stack. Is this legal? No, it's not. First of all, Ansford allows you to put all kinds of data on the return stack, including return addresses. But it doesn't require it. If you decide to build a Ford compiler that stores these return addresses somewhere else, that's fine. Second, you can take off a stack item with R from that you didn't put there with to R. Which we're kind of doing, aren't we? Now, what are coroutines? Aren't they just some fancy subroutines? No, they aren't. Stop thinking as one word as the caller and the other as the callee, and start thinking of them as cooperating equals. Let me show you the difference. <laughs> In short, if you call a subroutine, it starts all over again. If you call a coroutine, it resumes where you left off. Consequently, a coroutine may consist of an endless loop, no problem. You're just going for a part of the ride, aren't you? Not the full trip. In order to fully understand what's going on, I spent quite some time dumping the return stack because it quickly becomes quite confusing what calls what and what returns where, after you've juggled around those execution tokens and return addresses a few times. Oh man! Oh god! Oh man! Oh god! Now, first question, what does semicolon colon do? Like execute, it needs an execution token. It will execute the word associated with that execution token and then return to execute the part after the semicolon colon. First, it prints boomers. Then the execution token of call e3 is thrown on the stack. Now call e2 is called, and its return address is thrown on the return stack. It prints first this, and calls semicolon colon, and its return address is thrown on the return stack. There the call e3 execution token is thrown on the return stack. And when the end of semicolon colon is reached, the exit word pops it from the return stack and jumps to it. Gen Z is printed and again at the end of call e3 the exit word returns to the semicolon colon caller. It executes the second part of the call e2 definition, printing and now that. And at the end of call e2, the exit word returns to the call e2 caller. Finally, it prints both tada and here. Now that's basically how the semicolon colon works. 
Let's see in detail how it's used in local. Note all return stack references are callers, not the name of the callees. Now, this should be familiar, a local definition which is called by the divide definition of our previous video on local variables, and a few variables called A and B. We throw the parameters on the data stack and call divide. That call leaves an origin on the return stack. Then we throw the address of variable A on the data stack. We make a call to local and leave the origin of that call on the return stack. Like the Fred Behringer code, it stores the address of the variable and its former value on the return stack and transfers the origin to the data stack. Then it jumps back to the origin of the last local call, since that serves as an execution token and leaves a typical Behringer stack frame with the origin of the semicolon colon call on the top of the return stack. We find ourselves in a similar situation with the address of the B variable on the data stack and ready to call local again. And subsequently we build another Behringer stack frame, this time for variable B. Now we initialize our local variables and use them, leaving the result of our division on the data stack. We're close to the execution of the exit word. When that exit is executed, it takes the return address of the semicolon colon from the return stack and automatically jumps to the second part of the local definition. That one moves the value and address of the variable back to the data stack and restores its original value. When another exit is encountered, it does the same thing and effectively resolves the next stack frame. And finally, we jump back to the main routine, which call divide. We're done. But semicolon colon is not the only word associated with coroutines. Yield and grab are the other ones. Yield essentially establishes this previously mentioned cooperating equals relation. Grab is the word that breaks that relation. You can also break that relation by exiting a coroutine. So how does it basically work? We start off with a call to caller, but let's forget about that one. We enter caller and call callee, leaving an origin to that call from caller on the return stack. In callee, we make a call to yield and leave an origin to that call from callee on the return stack. Yield inverts those return addresses on the return stack. When the exit word of yield is encountered, it jumps back to caller, not callee. If the yield instruction there is encountered, a new origin is thrown on the return stack and the procedure is repeated. Think of it this way, I think it's easier to comprehend. Yield jumps to the top of the return stack and leaves its origin. Now let's dive a bit deeper and see how it actually works. We start off with a call from the REPL to the .fib and leave its origin on the return stack. .fib calls fib and also leaves its origin on the return stack. FIP provides the two Fibonacci numbers. Then it jumps back to the FIP call in .fib and continues execution until it encounters another yield word. Again, it jumps back to the yield call in FIP, leaves its origin on the return stack and enters the loop. Then it encounters a second yield in FIP jumps back to the yield in .fib and again leaves its origin on the return stack. By the way, we're still in the loop, because if we leave the loop we discard the values on the data stack, and grab discards the reference to yield in .fib, so .fib regains full control. When we reach the exit word, we're done. The final origin is consumed, we return to the REPL. That's it. Best thing is, if your Ford compiler allows coroutines, the entire library is just three lines. In 40H, two aliases and a single definition. With the preprocessor or macros, everything is inline, no definitions required. And ending on that positive note, I'm Hans Bezemer, and this was back and forth.